I guess they probably were finished by the time they were 40. And all for the sake of this material, this magical material. I wonder how many people looking at their precious 18th century Chinese porcelain today realize the effort and the human sacrifice that went into getting this material out of here and back down the mountain. Kaolin is simply clay. It occurs all over the world, but the variety here is particularly fine. The hard part is extracting it from the rock. This is kaolinized granite. You know granite is an extremely hard, dense rock, but when it's attacked by superheated steam uh, below the surface of the earth, um, some of the minerals turn to clay, and the white dusty material is the kaolin. And a good kaolinized granite will contain about 10 or 15% of that material. So a lot of the, the hard work is really separating that from the rock and using it for um, porcelain. That's what was happening in the mines above Jingde Zhen. Down below, at the foot of the mountain, the second and most magical ingredient was prepared. When the porcelain fever was at its height in Europe, ceramicists were desperate to discover what was added to kaolin to make it so covetably lustrous. Welcome to the world-famous Trip Hammer Mill at Yao Li. Arguably, one of the oldest industrial machines in the world. Hammers like this have been operating in China for over 2,000 years. And as you can see, the way this works, the water drives a wheel, the wheel turns an axle, and the pins in the axle engage these levered mallets, which rise and drop, rise and drop. You've got a sequence of them. And into these pits, we place China stone. It was China stone that made porcelain light and tough and in demand the world over. But what was it? The Chinese guarded their secret jealously. When Europeans eventually managed to make porcelain in the 18th century, they used a material called feldspar. But they still hadn't discovered what China stone really was. Chinese porcelain is probably really the most misunderstood material in ceramic history. The general misunderstanding of it is that it's um, a feldspathic material. But feldspar was not an ingredient in the first South Chinese porcelain. Its place really was taken by an, another mineral called uh, potash mica. And this is actually the main flux that's in this early porcelain. Mica melts at high temperature and gives you translucency. But its other great advantage is that it gives you plasticity because the crystal structure is what is known as platy. And almost all ceramics need this kind of platy mineral um, to produce plasticity. Plasticity meant that you could shape ceramics into a myriad of new forms and mica provided a bright surface. The use of cobalt blue under the glaze eventually led to the recognizable Chinese blue and white style. From the 16th century onwards, the Portuguese and then the Dutch demanded highly formal, compartmentalized designs crammed with Chinese scenes. From the 17th century, we begin to see enameled wares reaching Europe. Meanwhile, in Beijing, the emperors indulged their own tastes for wares so fine, so exquisitely potted, that they could make the most delicate export wares look lumpen. The court had their own color palette too. Yellow glaze was reserved for imperial eyes only. But all this beauty emerged from ugliness. Porcelain made Jingdezhen one of the world's first industrial cities. It also made it a seething, stinking hellhole. It was dirty, it was dark. The quality of people's lives there was extremely poor. It was very polluted because of all the kilns burning into the sky. The town itself was a warren of narrow alleys. 
with kilns and workshops opening off the alleys. It would have been like going back to one of the worst cities in Victorian Britain in the Industrial Revolution. Today, it's been cleaned up a bit, but Jingjijen is still the spiritual home of the world's porcelain industry. The town is one of many locations the imperial rulers wanted to keep from prying eyes. But a few outsiders did get in. One such was Jesuit priest Father Dantricol, who came here in the 18th century to spread the gospel and indulge in some industrial espionage. Here he is writing back to H quarters in Rome about the ceramics industry in Jingdezhen. When the cup leaves the wheel, it is taken by a second workman who puts it straight upon its base. Shortly afterwards, it is handed over to a third man who puts it on its mould and gives it its shape. A fourth workman pairs it down as much as is necessary for its transparency. It is surprising to see the rapidity with which these vessels pass through so many different hands. And I am told that a piece of fired porcelain has passed through the hands of 70 workmen. I can easily believe this by what I myself have seen. Today, the secret of porcelain is an open one, openly displayed at the town's open air museum. He's got a hump of clay and he can make several bowls out of one hump. It's an inertia wheel, it's just human power, there's no electricity here at all. And for as long as that wheel is going round, he's producing a bowl and he can probably do it in one winding up of the wheel. Fantastic. <laughs> Very good. Hun hao, hun hao. <laughs> The production line process that Father Dantricol described was in use in Jingdezhen long before the division of labor became the foundation of the Western Industrial Revolution. In Europe, we knew that porcelain came from a mysterious place, but also that it was forged in a hellish inferno. The dangers of the kiln, the risks faced by the brave workers just added to the romance and the price. The Jingdezhen Museum is constructed around an ancient kiln so large it takes months of production to fill its egg-shaped chamber and forests of timber to fuel it. Right, I'm taking you to one of the great, great sites in the world. This is the only remaining chicken's egg kiln. It is the biggest functioning kiln in the world. It still works. It was created in the Ming Dynasty. It's been working for over 400, 500 years, maybe. And it was in kilns like this that every single piece of Chinese export porcelain from Jingdezhen were created. Just look at the size of this thing. It's 20 meters long, and it has a chimney stack at the other end, 20 meters high. Those cylindrical boxes, those are called saggers, and inside those boxes are the wares that are to be fired. It takes days to fill this thing up, and when full, uh, this entry is bricked up with mortar and brick, and leaving a hole here, uh, the whole kiln is fired for two days, feeding through that hole 50 tons of firewood, pine wood, seasoned outside the door here. The flames are shooting out of the chimney at the other end and lighting up the sky. Now multiply that by 200 and you get some idea of why people talked about the fabled city of Jingdezhen being lit up. It was never dark. In recent years, Jingdezhen has become sweeter and fresher. Porcelain is still being made, but not on the same scale. When I first came to the city uh, in the late 1990s, uh, I looked across the horizon and I counted on one occasion at least 50 or 60 maybe chimney stacks all belching greasy black smoke across the city. Looking around the shops in Jingdezhen today, what we see is a change. The market's moved. Huge quantities of domestic wares, mass production, things made for the everyday kitchen table, made for us in the West, and things we are familiar with in the high street stores, in discount shops, and a market which 
we now see moving over to places like Poland and Taiwan, it's no longer just made in China. They're beginning to feel the competition. But the potters of Jingdezhen are adept at adapting to survive. As porcelain fever gripped the West, the Chinese were shown objects and images that we liked, and they were happy to have a stab at them. Artists switched from traditional motifs to depictions of people and places they'd never seen. Biblical scenes, images from old master paintings, even erotica. Special works were commissioned to celebrate great European events like the Jacobite Rebellion, which was over by the time the goods reached home. This was real enterprise, but it wasn't without problems. Since the Middle Ages, European artists had striven to give the illusion of depth and distance in painting. In the Chinese tradition, symbolism was more important. Chinese decorators, they didn't have um, a sense of perspective. And in one dish, we find that the landscape design is repeated in the foreground um, instead of uh, putting into a perspective that would have been used in, um, in Europe that were not familiar with the original source, that didn't know how to depict a European face properly. Sometimes they have uh, oriental uh, features. We also have inscriptions in Latin that very often contain mistakes because it was not a language known in China. Anyone can make a mistake. Dutch potters, disabled by their own understanding of perspective, saw images of pagodas that seemed to be the same size as men, and guessed they were some sort of vase. They began producing huge Chinese-inspired tulip holders. The potters of Jingdezhen were happy to incorporate artistic traditions, however barbarian. Can I interest you in an Henri Matisse? Or maybe in a Modigliani? Or would you prefer a Gauguin, or a Juan Ries, or a Claude Monet, or we've got irises and we've got sunflowers. This is, yes, a garden of Van Gogh. Each and every one of these vases has been commissioned by the museum or the art gallery in Europe or America that has the original artworks and wants them rendered into three dimensions. Absolutely amazing. I had no idea this was going on, and it just shows you that the 18th century export ware trade is alive and well in the 21st century. Adaptability kept the kilns of Jingdezhen alight, but my mission is to explore what made porcelain so sought after and so expensive in Europe. It was in part the ability to make something nobody else could. Today, porcelain is made everywhere, but here again, Chinese potters still have a unique selling point. At the Jiayang factory, they make crisp porcelain on a monumental scale. It's something so specialized that English artist and ceramics professor Felicity Aleaf has relocated here, making Jingdezhen the easternmost outpost of the Royal College of Art. This will come out blue and quite strong. Yeah. This will come out dry white porcelain. Yeah. This will be brown and then the, what's the colour under it, will, the glaze will bring out the blue. Yeah. So yeah. from one colour, cobalt, you've managed to make mm. three tones and with the biscuit and the glaze you've got at least, I guess, what, seven or eight depths of colour. If you come to Jindajen, which is the world's uh, capital, it's the porcelain city of China, there is only that one clay. And porcelain has that mystique. For me, it's very beautiful, it's very pure, and it's like having a large piece of paper, a large canvas for me to express myself with. 
to start with, some of the things I was asking them to help me with were 